Hey, Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. Now, I try to come up with a good bio whenever I bring someone onto a podcast. To say you're colorful is an understatement. <laughs> you are Mr. Immersion himself. How would you? Okay, me and you were sitting at a bar. And we're just waiting for our next drink to turn up before we've got to go off to our dates. How would you explain what it is you do? Man, that's a a great question. And it's honestly one that I've struggled with for a long time. (laughs) I used to just dodge the answer. But, you know, given 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 that we're recording this for, you know, an audience and posterity, I'll I'll give it my best shot. So, um, you know, I am an artist. I'm a director. I'm a designer. I'm a you know, fan of applying technology to new experiences and new forms of entertainment. And, and I'm an entrepreneur through and through, right? Um, I've started businesses in the kind of nonprofit art space. I've started commercial entertainment projects. I've started other companies, media companies, and uh, recently uh, a company to scale coaching, which is a service that's been really beneficial to me. But I'd say, you know, my passion, what I, like the through line of all of it is, is honestly reinventing experiences that enhance our experience of the world around us as human beings. So, so you could say I'm an experienced designer. That's sort of what they call me in the entertainment sphere. Um, you know, but I, I think, you know, there's a lot of talk of virtual reality and presence and the metaverse and all this stuff right now. And what I've done for 25 years is create experiences that transport you somewhere right? That like take you into another world, but not through goggles and just as a visual experience, but rather one that actually creates a world where you get to go in and participate in it. Um, let's give an example know, to, to yeah. someone listening to this. Let's, because I'll tell you, you're underselling it. You know, this is, this is <laughs> like a guy going, yeah, I do little things. And then he finds out that he built the Eiffel Tower. You know, to say that you do this uh, experience... Uh, Give us an example. Walk us through one of your clients and what you did to give them the the experience that you did. Well, you know, it's interesting. You say clients, um, you know, sometimes and it's it's rarer and rarer now that I work with brands and, and other companies and effectively clients. Um, most of what I've done is actually as an entrepreneur, which is raise equity, fund it myself or raise equity from investors to produce uh, an entertainment experience, start a business. But I'll, I'll give you two examples. One is um, for a client. I uh, was the creative director for Michael Kors, the fashion designer and brand. When he launched his brand on mainland China, we did an event for him uh, in Shanghai at Hunkow Airport, which was a, in a huge aircraft hangar. The theme was jet set, right? That's sort of the the, the the mindset, the brand, the aspiration that he presents. And Michael had been inspired by a number of places around the world, uh, Capri in Italy, um, New York, Aspen, you know, places that are kind of jet setty, but also for, for Michael are, are highly visual Paris, places that really inspired him. And so what we did was we created an immersive 360 degree video immersion um, and then a set that basically the set replicated uh, essentially um, uh, sort of a Studio 54 kind of vibe that was designed by Alex Bittek, who's a big French, um, you know, fashion designer. And what what I did and what my team did was we created this immersive video experience where you walked into this hangar, right? And we were initially projecting the walls of the hangar so that it was sort of a trompe l'oeil effect. You like just felt like, okay, I'm in a hangar, so what? And then as it started and the fashion show started, the you were basically transported with these enormous holographic video screens and all of this projection to capri to new york to aspen to paris to shanghai um and back to shanghai and and the idea was for you to feel like you were really there right and and to be immersed so that was and for michael that was like look i want to take people i want to show people one what it's like to live in the sort of jet set world and two, I want to show them the places that have inspired my clothing, my aesthetic. So that was that was that was for a brand. It cost roughly fifteen million dollars for that one night event, which the the real like the the main piece of it was about fifteen minutes. So you think about the investment of that, right? 
that that was a huge 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 event a million um, a minute okay yeah. that's pretty good you, you you price higher than me so that's good news <laughs> I, I i need to step up my game carry on um and then i'll give you an example of something that i produced uh, early on this was like definitely when i was still working you know kind of in the downtown new york art and theater scene and and in the you know making sort of avant-garde theater opera performance art immersive experiences and that's very much how i how and how and where i cut my teeth as an artist and as a as a producer but people used to ask me they say michael like immersive like what does that mean what do you do similar question and i would say well i'll give you an example um in theater, the traditional experience, if you were going to take a classic, right, the classic I'm going to, I'm going to use as an example is Dante's Divine Comedy, right? One of the great, you know, masterworks of, 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 of Italian literature, of literature generally. Um, what that story tells is, is, is Dante's journey through hell, purgatory, and paradise, right? This is epic. And a traditional theatrical telling of that would would show you, would have a character, Dante, and it would show you his journey through hell, purgatory, and paradise and the things that he experienced along the way. Okay, fine. That's that's a traditional kind of theatrical, the viewer is outside of it looking in, fine. My version of that, which is what I produced in 2001 that, you know, for that got a lot of press and a lot of buzz and New York Times did a big feature on it. What we did was in a 40,000 square foot warehouse in Dumbo, where I had had a studio and worked for a number of years, is we created sets that depicted Nine Circles of Hell, Purgatory, and Paradise. We cast the audience as Dante and took them on the journey, right? So instead of being an outsider looking in at someone else's experience, the audience was the agent, right? And, you know, there's a lot of theory. I think we talked about it before when you and I first met, but there's a lot of theory of where that came from. My belief and a lot of the whole sort of, you know, cultural theory group believes that this is the result of the, the, the desire for immersive entertainment has grown out of the the video game generation really what they're calling the, the the game generation which is sort of if you were born from like the early 70s right the first video game was introduced in 72 the first video game you're born in that era you were raised where the dominant media experience that you had was not television or movies where you're looking through a screen into a world instead in video games you're even though you're sort of watching it on a screen you're the agent right you're you're the one having the adventure your it's your risk it's your reward it's your experience that is driving everything and i think that that if you if you if you have a generation of people raised on that type of experience they don't want to sit outside of the story you know they don't and i think that that's where people like mark zuckerberg and meta you know formerly facebook are going with the idea of this metaverse and where a lot of media and technology is focused and I think that that's right, but I think that there's another way, right? I do virtual reality. The, the big project we're working on right now is a recreation of a country drive-in movie theater in 1965, basically built as a movie set inside of a huge 60,000 square foot air supported dome in South Carolina, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where we're gonna launch it next year. And you walk through the door and you're transported to a country drive-in movie theater in 1965 with cars and trees and fireflies and moon and stars above. And, and that's not, that's a virtual reality, but it's not like media based virtual reality, which personally, I don't want to spend a night with goggles on in that kind of virtual reality. Um, I'd rather do it, you know, with a crew of us rent a car, be transported back to that moment in time and have a really, shared experience which i think is a different sort of thing than you can get in virtual reality as it's done through oculus goggles and the like i i want to hook on a a future t-shirt slogan that i'm going to steal from you having your audience sitting outside of the story you know you were saying yeah. that we don't want that anymore and yeah. that that visualization of actually making them making them the story, making them immersive in it and not watching it from the outside. And I'd never really thought of the gaming concept. Everyone's always talked about the digi digital age being keypads. You know, I remember my mm -hmm. eldest, Henry, he's 24 years old, but my youngest, George, 
has never grown up with anything other than like an iPad and a touchpad. Yeah, mm -hmm. my son has, but I never thought of the gaming uh, context before. You're correct. We would try and get into, even though some of those older games, uh, you know, those little ping pong games and things like that and Galaxia, mm -hmm. they weren't exactly as beautifully visual as they are now, but we were very immersed in them. So yeah, I sure. do like about bringing your audience into the story. Now, you're, you're still doing that, mm -hmm. but you're actually now, you're, it's not so much of a pivot, but a parallel. You're actually working with individuals and corporations on coaching them within their holistic approach. What caused that branch out, mm -hmm. and what are you actually working, working on for your clients now? Well, you know, for I was an early adopter to coaching, right? I hired a coach in 2002 when I was producing, you know, I just raised a bunch of money in a series A. We'd started a media company. We're producing this big show that, that we eventually launched in New York city. And, and I, I knew that building a culture, I knew that getting the best out of myself creatively as an entrepreneur, as a business person, as a professional, as a, as a team member, just in, 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 in general, I was better off if I was having someone help kind of keep keep me aligned, right? Keep the friction low. And creative people can have a lot of friction, right? I think I think sometimes, you know, it's like that 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 classic like, you know, creator genius, creator destroyer, right? Like it's 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 a classic, you know, archetype. But I knew it. I experienced it personally. So I I was an early adopter to coaching and I benefited from it a lot. I hired coaches to coach my whole team. I had 12 employees at the time. And, and, and we created a great culture, right? Produced a lot of great stuff. The team was, was, was awesome at doing things way better than other teams that I'd worked with previously. And I think the coaching had a lot to do with it, right? Like helping people be their best in, in all aspects of their life helps them perform the best in their professional or, you know, creative life or whatever. And so over time, you know, I always worked with a coach, but you know, coaching was a little fringe back then. Like it wasn't like, I wasn't like advertising that I was like working with a coach at the time, but over the 20 years since 2002, it's really become much more mainstream. You hear people like Bill Gates, Eric Schmidt at Google say like, everyone needs a coach. Like it just helps you be the best version of whatever the hell you're trying to be. And it gives you that outside eye that says like, Hey, is this what you were trying to do? Is that what you're trying to do? And so for years I had worked with a coach and it benefited me, but about five or six years ago, I just had this this insight, which is like, why doesn't everyone have a coach? Like, why why hasn't it gone you know mainstream in this in this much broader sense? It has now, but six years ago, it was still sort of that was just sort of bubbling up. And I thought, look, you know, part of what I've done historically is is help take ideas that are kind of new and and make them more accessible and 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 you know popularize them or add a, a user experience aspect. You know, a lot of the work that I did creatively was take these sort of very like avant-garde art and theater ideas and then apply them to kind of more mainstream entertainment. So if I've done that before and I've done that in many different contexts with technology and elsewhere, I said, maybe I could contribute to helping coaching go a bit more mainstream. And so I partnered with my coach who was a you know Stanford MBA, worked at Deloitte, was coaching top, top, top executives. And, and I said, hey, what if we could take what you do, which is very bespoke and very limited to just the people that you can coach? And I'm like, what if we could scale that? And so we worked on a vision. We launched it about a little over four years ago. And I was doing that very much on the side, honestly. Like I invested money. I worked with her. I helped create the vision. I helped design some of the tech to get it going. I brought together some of the team. I brought together eventually some investors to back it. Again, this is still like, you know, Better Up, which is the company that is now the behemoth, is $5 billion valuation, offers a service, by the way, that I think our service is far superior to what they offer. But but like that, they still weren't even on the radar yet. Like you Google coaching, there wasn't like 10 companies that were doing it. Now it's everywhere. But back then it wasn't. And I just thought like, these are parallel paths. Like I didn't quite see it. Like my business manager, who's been my kind of a, you know, he's like a talent manager for, I worked with him for a decade. He was like, wait, you want to do what, Michael? Like that has nothing to do with anything that you've done. I'm like, well, you know, he's trusted that I'm if I'm drawn to something, it's because I'm passionate about it. And maybe there's something there. So we kind of humored me and we went after it and we built this thing. And and it was again, like like you said, there was there were sort of parallel paths and somewhat unrelated. But as I started to really see 
coaching our company, which is called a plan coaching. Um, you know, we started to impact companies that we were working with. We started to see companies perform better. We saw individuals like have total transformations. And, and then when COVID hit and the entertainment business just like locked down, mm. I had a window of time that turned into about, you know, 18 months, almost two years of time when I could just really focus on that. And the company's gone parabolic. Like we're, we're growing, growing, growing. You know, we went from like five coaches to 50. We have 50 coaches now and we're working with companies like you know, Google and MetLife and Stripe and top tech companies. And, you know, we're being brought in by venture capital firms to like work with the companies that they're funding. And I think what it is ultimately, and I'm not a coach, I don't do the coaching myself. You know, like I, I, I help craft vision and the user experience. I bring kind of the customer perspective in effect. Um, my partner is really the coach who's the sort of the brain trust there. And now we have as I said, 50 coaches, but like, the idea is like I knew a lot about how how to optimize myself as a creative person and as an entrepreneur and and to be able to translate that for others has been like incredibly rewarding work and it's super successful and it's interesting now that's kind of taking off in its own right the world hopefully after omicron you know we're recording this what on on a, yeah. you know January twelfth or something, you know it's like hopefully in a few weeks Omicron will be done. We'll be coming out out of this COVID disaster, and entertainment will start to reemerge. And hopefully, I'm planning next year to really shift attention back uh, to a certain extent to some of the entertainment stuff, and realize August Moon, which is the drive-in concept I was describing yeah. in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and and then have these two things sort of support and help each other, honestly. And, 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 um, you know, and I, I, I feel like on the other side of all of this, I've realized that I really love to coach entrepreneurs. I love to take the things that I've learned as a, you know, midlife guy, done a lot of stuff, but like now to sort of, you know, mentor and, and work with others. And I've, you know, I've taught a few classes here and there. I taught a class at Princeton a few years ago and it was fun, but like to really take that to the next level and to apply that learning to, an emerging, you know, crop of, you know, young creative people who are entering a world with a tremendous amount of potential. Coaching's a funny thing. Um, mm. Let's, let's be blunt, you know, like seven, yeah. seven years ago and earlier, like 10 or 12 years ago, if you had a coach, mm -hmm. then people would look at you almost as though you had a therapist, you know, why can't you do it yourself? What do you need a coach for? You know? Mm -hmm. And then there was always the classic, you know, for those that can't teach, so, and now we've moved into a world where people are understanding that there is no one out there that is, that's exceptional that doesn't have a coach. For you know, sure. Michael Jordan sure. has a coach, you know, every, every politician and governor had a, had a coach. Everyone out there has Steve Jobs had a coach. Everyone has a coach to the point that we've ended up in saturation where everyone thinks they're a coach just because mm. they can talk to a couple of people. So yeah. it, it we've really seen, I'm hoping that not only COVID is, you know, it's either going to pass or we're going to learn to live with it, but we're going to start to see and question the coaches that are out there because too many people are out there thinking, well, I ain't got a business now. I can't do the construction. I can't do that. I'm going to become a coach. Yeah, that'll yeah. make me money. We have a need to be coached um, strictly and articulately but we also need to see through the bullshit and not just take on anyone just because they're leaning up against a car that they don't own and they look pretty. So I, how do I, I we... couldn't agree more. So <laughs> there you go. So how do we pick God, this has gone a different tangent. I wasn't mm -hmm. expecting to go down this tangent <laughs> yeah. and we're going to go back to August moon in a second. Cool. But how, how do we pick the right coach? Cause, cause I'm a coach, you're a coach and we're very different. So yeah. how, if you're out there and you're listening to this going, well, okay, I accept that the people, people are better with a coach. Mm -hmm. um, how do you pick the right coach? Well, I mean, it's a great question. And, and I, I would, I would, I would challenge a couple of things you said. One is I'm not a coach. I, I can coach, like I coach my kids and, you know, and like give them guidance. Right. But that's a different thing than someone who is a professional coach. Right. And the truth is, the most capable people, like, like I, I kind of know this from being a, a director, right, of theater and, and 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 events and things. Like the best actors, Meryl Streep, 
needs a director. LeBron James needs a coach. Like to have that outside eye, and, and a director is just another word in effect for a, a yeah, type of coach, right? Of to be is. to give an outside eye, to be that perspective that no one can get of themselves. Like we can never see us as others see us, just a function of reality, right? And and so that's a that's a feature. Why, why does that do I think everyone needs a coach? Because of that, right? To realize your talent, to get that outside eye, to get that perspective. But one, not everybody's a coach. And 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 I think that you there, there's a there's a way, there are definitely schools of thought. There's there's being trained as a coach, there's studying to be a coach, there's understanding what it means. And our our brand of coaching is it has nothing to do with advising, right? We're not consultants. I'm not here to if I was your coach, I'm not here to tell you what to do. Rather, I'm here to apply a very specific protocol to help you figure out your brilliance and to unlock it, right? To get to reduce the friction that exists in you. Now, there are companies I referred to better up earlier, right? That, that really believe like a coach is a coach is a coach. I call bullshit on that. Like, I do not believe that to be the case. And I think that there are better approaches. There are better methodologies. There is the better application of technology to coaching. There are better schools of thought around it. And what we've done, right? I, I worked with five coaches over the last 20 years. I picked the one that was far and away superior to everybody who it, it happens by the way, that her father, her name is Sarah Ellis Conant. She's my business partner. She was my coach for many years. Her father, Dave Ellis, was one of the founders of the coaching movement in America 30 years ago. Like he was the one who wrote the first books that introduced the word, the term coaching in the way that we know it. I don't mean like a sports coach. I mean like a professional wellness, you know, performance coach, right? And and so like she had it like in her DNA and she had grown up with these ideas. So she was far and away the best coach that I had ever worked with. And then we went and found the best coaches who were the most experienced coaches? Like some of our coaches have been doing it for 30 years. Like you get a lot of people who are like, shit, I could be a coach, whatever. You know what I mean? And I'm doing it now because I put up a shingle. I say I'm a coach. That's not the real deal. The real deal is if you're trained, if you've done it, if you've coached people, if you've you know written about, if you've studied neuroscience and understand how we learn and why we learn and what impacts friction and what impacts wellness and what impacts performance and and you understand those things so like we found the people that understood those things we brought them together we developed a methodology that is consistent across all of our coaches and and we apply that to companies big and small you know from the likes of google and metlife to nike and autodesk and stripe big big you know critical companies fortune 500 fortune 100 companies and tons of stall small startups but we apply a consistent use of technology, a consistent methodology, a consistent approach and philosophy, and and we 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 that's all guided by the tech, and it's incredibly, you know, effective, right? It works, and I, I don't think that like being a coach is just being an outside eye and telling people what you think. That's not what we do, and I don't think that's what everybody needs. Like, I don't need more advice in my life. I need someone that can help me determine what I want, make a plan to get it, and then support me in going after it day by day. Because that is what entrepreneurs need. It's what artists need. It's what you know people who are trying to produce and create anything need. And I think that's everybody now as we move into this very distributed kind of social entrepreneur economy. So your entire group share the same vision. Yeah. And that is similar. And so we're, we're, we're now using that as a segue back into the creativity side of you, which yep. we can see the linkage. We can yep. see a very definite link of, of the creativity. But within vision, you both got to sh any communication, any relationship, you both got to share the same vision. Yep. If we look at something like you doing this massive driving uh, experience, mm -hmm. who comes up with that vision? Well, you know, it, it's funny. I mean, in the case of, 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 of August Moon, you know, I did and I developed it with a team. But, you know, like there, there, there are, excuse me, I mean, there are many people who work on it. But it's like, you know, I think any business, any, any artwork, great film, great book, it kind of comes from a singular voice a singular creative expression but then there are many 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 people who contribute to it and and many things that inspired it you know many things that have brought that idea kind of into the world um but then it's the people who 
the artist, the entrepreneur who takes that idea and really shapes it into a, a concrete and producible plan and, and, and then goes after it, you know, with all the persistence that that takes. I mean, and, and kind of gets everybody on board. Like one thing that I've been good at in my career, which I'm very grateful for, is, is to be able to like communicate the vision, right? So that everybody can understand, and that might be drawing it, it might be, you know, producing it in 3D, it might be, you know, communicating in some other form or expressing the passion or showing other pictures, showing references, introducing a film that kind of gets to the spirit of what I'm after, but can communicate it so that we all start making the same production. You know, one of the biggest mistakes that people make, I think, you know, it's been said about like, you know, theater. It's like, we all need to be making the same show. When things go wrong is when I'm making this show and you're making that show over there and they're not the same show. And then we're, and then that's friction, right? Like there's friction within the individual. And then there's also friction within a team or a process. And I think that, you know, you have to have creative leadership that can express that vision. And then you need a whole team that's supporting that, that consistent vision so that everybody's behind, you know, and working towards the same goal ultimately. We've said the word vision a fair few times. A good friend of mine, Cameron Harold, who's spoken at our speakeasies, um, he actually, uh, the master behind Vivid Vision, he actually said that, you know, you hire on vision and culture. He mm -hmm. said, because if you've got someone that can't marry the same vision of you, no matter how good, qualified and talented they are, you actually drive in different tracks. So totally. he always said exactly the same as you. You want to be making the same show, not different shows. As we come to a wrap up, how can people find out more about you, Michael? Well, um, two ways. I mean, they're, they're, as we've talked about, there are sort of two sides of, of, of what I do that we've talked about today. So there's the coaching side, which is uh, a plan coaching, a dash plan coaching.com is the URL. Um, and you can see there's like, you know, there's a sort of a, an expression of the vision, an expression of what we do. Just, you know, Google it, whatever. But it's, it's, you can see, 50 coach profiles. You can really understand the philosophy. You can experience the tech, et cetera. The other side is uh, countsprojects.net. That's counts, my name, projects.net. And that's all the creative stuff. That's August Moon. That's the Michael Kors fashion show. That's a ton of operas I've done in you know, Europe, Asia, New York, elsewhere. Um, and theatrical productions and uh you know and that's that's sort of the creative side and and i think that again as we've said today it's like those two things are very related but as a, as of this moment they're separate entities they're separate companies they're separate visions in effect but they're very related in their dna and um you know and i i love you know to if there's an opportunity for people who are listening to kind of get curious about august moon learn about it you know get involved in some way awesome. You know, that's welcome. And we'll be opening next spring in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and then expanding domestically and internationally. And if people are looking for, you know, assistance in performance in their own entrepreneurship or whatever the hell they do in the world and would benefit from a coach, you know, check that out. Cause it's, um, you know, it, it, it really works. Like I know for me, it's like working with a coach changed everything in a very positive way. Perfect. Well, I'm going to make sure those links are in here. Michael, thank you very much for your time today. I know we're going to cross paths very soon. Stay safe up in New York, and I'll speak with you soon. Sounds good, Steve. Thanks for having me, man. It's been a pleasure.